Okay, so let's jump into hematology review. So we only have two PowerPoints to go through today for heme and coag. We're not really doing pictures um, because you did a lot of hopefully differentials and stuff like that in your practicum. Um, before we jump in, I think, I don't know if anybody explained to you guys what the final exam tomorrow will look like or not, but I'll just reiterate it because I don't think it has to be a surprise. Um, it is 100 questions. It's all multiple choice. So that's nice. We set it up similar to the boards because boards are always multiple choice. So 100 questions, it's gonna be 20 questions chemistry, 20 questions microbiology, 20 question team coag, 20 blood bank, 10 urinalysis, and 10 questions immunology. None of those questions should be a surprise to you. It should be very, knock on wood, <laughs> like very straightforward, nothing to trick you, um, just, do you know your stuff at this point? And you guys should. At this point, there should be no big surprises on that test or anything like that. So we've done it like this for a long time and we've set you up pretty well with all the review we've done and everything. So um, keep studying. Use those module 11 practice questions as well. I think, are they in your practicum or capstone course? They're in one of them. There's a bunch of module 11 practice questions. Use those, those are super helpful. Students have told me in the past that those were always helpful as well, you know, and keep doing your media lab and everything else like that too, and your board study guidebooks. But um, there is a bunch of module 11 practice questions that students have really liked in the past. Okay. And they're in the capstone, thank you. Um, and it's very okay to be nervous. Everybody's always nervous. I was nervous for my big final exam too before I graduated, I get it. Um, so just do your best, bring with you a basic calculator um, you know, for any calculations that might be on there. Otherwise, I think, I think that's it. If you guys ever have questions, just let me know. Again, because of the way I have to do WebEx this morning, I'm gonna have to flip my screen to see the chat box. That's why I was trying to get my other way to work and it didn't. So this way I have to flip between screens to see the chat. I can't pull the chat box out and put it on my, up with my PowerPoint slide. So I have to flip back and forth a lot here. So just bear with me on that. Um, so I'll try to check the chat box here and there as we go. Okay, so let's jump into our heme co capstone review. All the way to the very basics. Um, we, of course, have white cells, red cells, platelets, knowing the functions of all the cells. So white cells as a whole are all about defense of your immune system. So the segmented neutrophils, monocytes, all do this by phagocytosis, gobbling up that bacteria that shouldn't be there. Lymphocytes, remember you have T and B lymphocytes, they're involved in humoral and cell-mediated immunity, so that's kind of coming out of immunology world. So again, the B lymphocytes are involved with the humoral, they make the antibodies along with plasma cells, and then T lymphocytes do the cell-mediated, where they can do a lot of communication. Eosinophils, basophils have a whole thing with allergies, um, and they do other roles, of course. Red cells, so with your red cells, we all know red cells carry oxygen. That's their main goal. Um, some little notes here, don't forget about the rule of three. So you should be able to take your hemoglobin times three and it should roughly equal your hematocrit. That's just a nice quality check to make sure everything looks good there. Again, that only really works well if it's pretty much normal acidic type cells being seen. If the cells are getting really oddly like bigger or smaller than they should be, then sometimes that doesn't always work to so use that rule of three. Your cell indices are MCV, MCH, MCHC. You do need to know how those are calculated and all that good stuff with them. And then RDW, that is given to us by the analyzer and that is an indicator, again, of anisocytosis, so any variation in cell sizes on the smear. Your platelets, of course, are all about clotting. And MPV, you probably saw that on your CBC reports. Um, MPV just tells us the average size of platelets. So MCV tells us the size of red cells. MPV tells us the size of platelets. Okay, hematopoiesis, which is your cell development. There was that fetal hematopoiesis timeline. Again, this is kind of also learned in immunology class. So it starts in the yolk sac for about two to five weeks, and then it will begin making cells in the liver. And then by the sixth month, 
of the fetus, the bone marrow will take over to making the cells and be forever there on out into adulthood, unless their bone marrow fails. But that is kind of the timeline is yolk sac to liver to bone marrow. Lymphopoiesis is just the production of lymphocytes. Again, your B cells will mature in the bone marrow. Your T cells will become a full T cell in the thymus. And erythropoiesis, the big mention there is we cannot make red cells without that erythropoietin hormone, EPO hormone. So that erythropoietin hormone is absolutely necessary in order for us to make red cells. And you probably know the question I'm going to ask, but where is your erythropoietin hormone made? What makes the erythropoietin hormone? Yeah, you guys got it. It is the kidneys. Good. So the kidneys will have oxygen sensing cells in them. And when they sense your body is like lower in oxygen, like maybe you're anemic or whatever, they will kick up more erythropoietin to go to the bone marrow and help get more red cells out there. Okay, so hemoglobin, we of course have the heme and the globin part. So your globin, remember, are just amino acid chains put together. You always have two alpha chains and two something else in adults. Your heme is the protoporphyrin ring, which contains carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Inside that ring is where your oxygen is held with the iron. Um, or not inside. Inside is where the iron is. <laughs> this is what attaches to the oxygen, but inside is where the iron is. And again, iron must be in that serous two plus state. Okay, so again, iron has to be in that serous 2 plus state. Remember, if it changes into that ferric 3 plus state, then we do not deliver the oxygen the way that we should be. Again, in all adults, there should be hemoglobin A, which is 2 alpha, 2 beta, hemoglobin A2, 2 alpha, 2 delta, and hemoglobin F, 2 alpha, 2 gamma. So there are some abnormal hemoglobin variants that can occur. Carboxyhemoglobin is when somebody has been exposed to carbon monoxide. If your hemoglobin molecule has a choice between oxygen and carbon monoxide, it will always pick the carbon monoxide. It really likes it. And so as a result, that's what's so dangerous about carbon monoxide is that eventually you don't have oxygen at all going to your tissues and that will cause death. Met hemoglobin is when your iron turns into that ferric or ferric three plus eight. Remember the saying is ferric is icky. We don't want our iron in that state. It, we want it in the two plus ferrous is for us. And then salt hemoglobin happens through the different drug exposures or exposure to different drugs, I should say. Okay, so we talked about this on. Um, in chemistry review, the oxygen dissociation curve, but here it is again. If you shift it to the left, you have a high affinity. You love that oxygen. The hemoglobin is going to keep it and not let go of it as easily. So these are all the conditions in which that will shift an oxygen curve to the left to keep hanging on to that oxygen. So if you have low CO2, 2,3 BPG and temperature, it will all shift to the left, or if you have an alkaline or high pH. So then the opposite is true. If you shift to the right, you write release. You have little affinity. You don't care. It wants to get rid of the oxygen. It wants to deliver it easily. So again, acidic pH, high CO2, high 2,3 BPG, high temperature will all shift to the right. I did go over kind of the reasoning behind each of these on in chemistry. So I'm going to just save us the time here and move on, but you can revisit that on uh, the chemistry recording. You guys already have that link. The red cell pathways to getting energy is the Emden-Meyer-Hoff pathway, also known as anaerobic glycolysis. And again, at the very end of that, you get two ATP molecules for energy for that red cell. The other big pathway to know was the hexose monophosphate pathway, also known as aerobic glycolysis. The end of this pathway, it gives us glutathione or glutathione, however you want to say it. The purpose or the function of glutathione is it's like, I always say it's like a bouncer for your red cells. It protects them from oxidative damage. And so 
there is an enzyme that's a part of this pathway called the G6PD enzyme, the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme. There is conditions where people are missing or deficient in this enzyme. As a result, they do not perform this pathway and they don't have this glutathione to protect their red cells from being hemolyzed and exposed to this oxidative damage. So people who have G6PD deficiency, a lot of times might be doing okay, but if they have to take certain medicines or certain things that will expose them to that oxidative damage, that's when they have hemolysis occurring. And that G6PD deficiency is the one where they have the Heinz bodies are largely present in that, and then bite cells because the macrophages are trying to remove out those Heinz bodies. So that is all part of the hexose monophosphate pathway, getting us glutathione to protect our cells. And I don't know if I've ever said this to you guys, I said it at one point, I can't track what I say where, but interestingly enough, um, glutathione has become a big thing in skincare lately. Like I like stuff like that, like reading and learning about, this. and you'll hear about it in skincare now as protecting your cells on your, so people have been using that in as a skincare ingredient or something as well. So it's kind of interesting. All right, so let's talk about hemolysis. We know that we learned about hemolysis with two pathways, intravascular and extravascular. So the difference is where they began. Does the hemolysis start in the side, the bloodstream with intravascular? Or is the hemolysis occurring, say, in the spleen, which would be extravascular? Either way, they're gonna both go through kind of the same type of cycle. They just have different starts. So in general, the red cell will lyse and release out the hemoglobin molecule. Hemoglobin is gonna break back down into its two basic parts, heme and globin. So we know globin chains were amino acids put together. Those amino acids are gonna float off and be reused in your body elsewhere. We're all about reusing if we can. That leaves your heme. Your heme again was made of that protoporphyrin ring and iron. So the iron is gonna go and get transported that hopefully back to the bone marrow and get reused. So we're gonna reuse our iron. Now we have just a protoporphyrin ring left that protoporphyrin ring is gonna convert into what we call biliveritin, which converts into bilirubin. And we all know bilirubin, we can measure bilirubin as part of a liver panel easily in chemistry. In the liver, that bilirubin will join with two glucuronic acids to make what we call conjugated bilirubin, or you can also call it direct bilirubin, either term works. Once that is conjugated, it will travel to the intestines as part of bile, convert into urobilinogen, uro for urine, we're gonna now excrete it out into your urine. And now we're rid of it. So we kind of reuse the parts that we can and then got rid of the other parts that we can't really reuse. So again, we always have old dying red cells. So we always are going through this process to a certain level. That's why we all have a little bit of bilirubin happening and we all have urobilinogen in our urine. So when you guys are doing those urine dipsticks, when you read that urobilinogen pad, it's always point to, it's never a negative. It's always at least a point two or above, right? There's always a value to it. And that's because we always have dying red cells that we're going through this process. Now, when there's a hemolytic disease happening or a parasite or something that's causing hemolysis, now the level is elevated. Now we're gonna have maybe more bilirubin and more urobilinogen happening as a result of elevation in that hemolysis process. So the deal with the extravascular is that starts in the spleen or maybe in the liver and does that whole process. In the intravascular, there's a couple steps that happen before it gets to the rest of that. Um, so when those cells lyse inside the bloodstream, we have to first save that hemoglobin, otherwise it'll get filtered out through the kidneys and then we lose all those parts that we could have reused. We lose the amino acids and the iron that we could have reused. So there are some proteins that help us save it. Haptoglobin is probably the main one. So haptoglobin will bind that hemoglobin, travel it to the liver, and then we'll break it down and do what we can. When haptoglobin does this though, it is depleted in that process. We cannot use haptoglobin again. Um, that one. So as a result, we always see decreased haptoglobin levels with a hemolysis that's occurring in intravascular hemolysis. Hemopectin and albumin are the other two proteins that are involved here as well. Those do get reused. They don't deplete like haptoglobin does, 
you might see hemopectin levels decrease in intravascular hemolysis, and that's because they're actively being used to travel. So if you were to measure someone's hemopectin level, they might have so low, and that's because they're actively functioning and they're often the liver doing their job and delivering, but they don't necessarily get depleted. Whereas half the globin does get depleted when it's being doing this. So the three very key characteristic signs of an intravascular hemolysis were always hemoglobinemia, hemoglobinuria, and hemosiderinuria. Hemoglobinemia just means you have free floating hemoglobin in the blood. Makes sense. Your cells are life. You got that hemoglobin freely floating now. Hemoglobinuria is hemoglobin that has been filtered through the kidneys into the urine. That happens. We can't save all of it. Same with hemosiderin. Hemosiderin is a form of iron, so that gets sucked into the urine as well. Can't save everything. The key poikilocytes that you'll see are schistocytes and keratocytes. Those are always seen in the same intravascular diseases, so fragmented cells. An extravascular, remember, a key um, poikilocyte finding there of extravascular hemolysis was spherocytes. All right, now let's jump into our anemias, which are always kind of tough for people to remember. So we categorize anemias based on their cell size first. So we have microcytic, normocytic, and macrocytic. It helps if you can remember what categories they fit into, because that's one thing when you're reading like a case study question with results, and it's like an anemia-based question, you can look at the MCV and decide what size it is, and you could already start narrowing down what you might think it would be. So microcytic is made up of iron deficiency anemia, anemia of chronic inflammation, sideroblastic anemia, thalassemia, and hemoglobin E disease would all fit under microcytic category. Normocytic category is sickle cell anemia, aplastic anemia, and hemolytic anemia. Now, anemia chronic inflammation can also fit into the normocytic category. It kind of can fit in both worlds. So I put that there, both microcytic and normocytic. In macrocytic, you have liver disease, megaloblastic anemia, and you can have aplastic anemia. So I put that there. That one can fit into two categories, normocytic and macrocytic. So that's just kind of a broad overview. Now, going through, I just put some key things here because we can't go too into depth on all of these. You'll have, hopefully you remember them from class or you have information you can re-look up. Iron deficiency anemia, we'll start there. Number one, most common anemia that we see. So it truly means they're deficient in iron, which is nice and easy. The name is exactly what it is. And they're deficient in iron due to a number of reasons. So on a CBC, of course, you're gonna see it's microcytic cells. So you should see a low MCV. You might have a few poikilocytes like ellipsocytes, maybe a target cell. Nothing too exciting that way. And then to confirm it's iron deficiency, so if the doctor's like, oh, let's see if they have iron deficiency, they're going to measure their serum iron, their ferritin, their TIBC, their percent saturation, that kind of stuff. They'll do the iron studies. So classic iron studies look for iron deficiency is low serum iron, low ferritin, but a high TIBC, and that was always kind of a key finding there. Anemia, chronic inflammation, this is the one that comes about from some sort of chronic inflammatory disease the patient has. This is very common anemia with hospitalized patients. So whenever somebody has that chronic inflammatory disease, they have those acute phase reactive proteins that are responding with that inflammation. Well, the problem with some of those proteins are they impede the use of our iron. They either bind and take out the iron when we're having it come in, instead of us being able to use that iron through, you know, and absorb it and use it, they bind it before we can use it. Or they will kind of store it away, you know, whatever they're doing. So like they're taking away the use of our iron. So you might have iron in storage. That's why you can have a normal for high ferritin because ferritin is an acute phase reactive protein, but your serum iron is still low because it's getting, it's taking it out of the ability out of that serum to use. So it's putting it away or binding it and keeping it. And then the other key feature is you will see a low TIBC and that TIBC kind of helps separate this one from iron deficiency because they do look very similar. Sideroblastic anemia, um, this was due to either lead poisoning or the different porphyrias. 
So again, it's microcytic on a blood smear, you might see basophilic stippling. And then again, if you were to stain the bone marrow with Prussian blue stain, which looks for iron granules, you'll see those classic ringed sideroblasts. So you'll see the iron granules circling around waiting to be put into the protoporphyrin ring inside that hemoglobin or while they're building that hemoglobin. And they just can't, either they're missing a step in how they're building that protoporphyrin ring, that's what's happening in porphyrias is they're missing an enzyme or a step, they can't build it properly or lead is interfering with that process. Thalassemias, there's alpha or beta thalassemias. We name it for what chain is impacted. I do believe I have another slide on that, so I'm gonna hold off from saying anything more there. Hemoglobin E disease was one type of hemoglobinopathy um, in which they have hemoglobin E present. This was seen most commonly in Southeast Asia. All right, moving over to normocytic cells. Sickle cell anemia is under the normocytic category. Yes, they have sickle cells present, but the rest of the cells that are not sickled are pretty much normal in size. And again, the sickle cell anemia, that hemoglobin S that is seen here is made when glutamic acid is replaced by valine in the sixth position of the beta chain. So that is something you need to remember. You should always remember your hemoglobin S substitution for boards and your hemoglobin C substitution. Those would be the two I would remember. I wouldn't worry about the rest of them. There's too many. But if you're going to remember any hemoglobinopathy substitutions, I'd remember hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C for your boards. And I think I talk more on sickle cell. I feel like I have another slide on sickle cell anemia, but you know the crux of sickle cell anemia is that you have hemoglobin S because of that amino acid switch. And so you do see sickle cells as present on the smear, target cells are seen on the smear. Um, and then we can diagnose through hemoglobin solubility test and hemoglobin electrophoresis. Aplastic anemia was basically bone marrow failure. Most of the time, we're not sure why that person's bone marrow has failed. 70% of the time it's unknown. Maybe it's something hereditary. There was a bunch of different aplastic anemia bone marrow failure disorders that we kind of discussed in that chapter. As a result of your bone marrow failing, you'll see pancytopenia, so all cell lines are decreased. Um, so that's a big key feature there. And so as a doctor investigates, they might end up going to look at the bone marrow if they can't figure out another reason why they have pancytopenia. And then they would see a very hypocellular um, picture of that bone marrow. Hemolytic anemias, again, it could be intravascular, extravascular. Um, a key feature of hemolytic anemias are, is a high or increased reticulocyte count. Again, reticulocyte counts are performed to assess your bone marrow. What is it doing? And anytime we see a high retic count, it's telling us your bone marrow is compensating for destroyed cells. It is compensating for something happening. Over to the macrocytic side, liver disease, again, is large, round macrocytes present. Megaloblastic anemia, though, has more of those oval macrocytes present. So that's kind of a key feature of megaloblastic is that their macrocytes are more oval in shape, whereas in liver disease they're round. Remember, megaloblastic anemia can be either folate deficiency or vitamin B12 deficiency. There is a different form of vitamin B12 deficiency known as pernicious anemia. This is where they're missing that intrinsic factor to help absorb vitamin B12. Somebody could be vitamin B12 deficiency, have normal amounts of intrinsic factor, but just not getting the B12 in their diet the way they should be. Or they could be missing that intrinsic factor and that's why they can't get in B12. So there is two different types there, but all of this falls under the megaloblastic category. And remember the reason that this results in an anemia is folate and B12 are needed to help make DNA for your cells while you're producing cells. If you can't make DNA, you can't make cells very well. And so you'll see pancytopenia again here. So all cell lines will be low. You'll see those large red cells, macrocytes. And in the bone marrow, you would see what we call megaloblastic looking red cells. And that is where you have very large cells, lots of cytoplasm, but the nucleus is lagging behind in maturity. And that's because again, the DNA is found inside the nucleus. So if you can't make DNA, you're not maturing that nucleus at the same rate the rest of the cell is maturing. 
So the rest of the cell is still maturing along, but the nucleus is lagging behind. So you get these kind of bizarre looking red cells. Other key things that you're gonna find here is those hyper segmented neutrophils, Jolie bodies, again, Jolie bodies are DNA. Um, you can see teardrop cells, bacteriocytes, so things like that, cabot rings might be found there. So they have some fun little things that can go along with megaloblastic anemia. Okay, all right. This is a big broad overview of anemia. So we do need to remember our proikilocytes. Um, hopefully you guys all know what they look like by now, but I think I do have a picture slide here just to practice coming up of points for inclusions. Again, knowing what diseases go with the proikilocytes also help. Like, so again, if you're given a case study question with results and, oh, these are the points seen there, you can kind of already start picturing what possibly might be happening. So again, these are the ones that you should be familiar with from acanthocytes, which are nicknamed spur cells. That occurs a lot with liver disease. Echinocytes, which are nicknamed burr cells. Um, that goes along with like uremia, so kidney disease or pyruvate kinase deficiency were the two big ones there. Codocytes are your target cells, that they're seen with a lot of stuff. Um, liver disease, thalassemia, sickle cell disease, the hemoglobinopathies in general, some iron deficiency. Ellipsocytes, same thing here, thalassemia, iron deficiency. Schistocytes and crowdocytes are both seen in intravascular hemolysis. Spherocytes are seen in Vascular hemolysis or hereditary spherocytosis. Somatocytes are seen um, with liver disease. Bacteriocytes, which are teardrops, that would be megaloblastic anemia. Um, myelodysplastic syndrome would have bacteriocytes. Trypanocytes are your sickle cells, so that's anytime a hemoglobin S is present. And then oval macrocytes, again, are megaloblastic anemia. So just kind of a really broad overview. You guys remember, have that study guide you made on proikulocytes back from hematology one. So if you still have that, you have them all listed there. All right, some inclusions. Um, you do need to remember what the inclusions are made of. And again, you can link them with disease. So, oh my gosh, my back. Um, Let's see here, which picture, so if we go top, what is this, top left, what inclusion is seen in the top left picture there? So that top left picture is just using right stain, the normal, typical right stain. All right, so that is Howell Jolly Bodies. So Howell Jolly Bodies are usually just one per cell, and again, they're made of DNA. Um, made of DNA, really commonly seen with megaloblastic anemias. The top right is a super vital stain. You can kind of tell by the bluish gray look to everything. There's not nice colors there. That is a super vital stain. And the top right would be your Heinz bodies. You can always tell that because one, you can't see Heinz bodies on right stain. So you're not gonna see that in a normal right stain. And then when you do use super vital stain, you'll notice the Heinz bodies are always right on the very edge of those cells. So that's a key look. And Heinz bodies, again, are made of hemoglobin. So we see this a lot with like G6PD deficiency would be one. What do you think this bottom left is? Bottom left. Good, you guys. Pappenheimer bodies, yes. So, we know that because they're kind of clustered together in a little grouping. You never just get one, really. It's always like a cluster of it. And again, Pappenheimer bodies are made of iron. Um, so if somebody had like an iron infusion, say somebody had a really severe iron deficiency and they got iron infusions, you might see these Pappenheimer bodies kind of show up there. 
the little clusters of iron. And then the bottom right would be basophilic stippling. And the way we know that is it covers the entire red cell there. So whereas Pappenheimer binders are kind of clustered up, basophilic stippling is covering the entire cell. And that is made of RNA. And again, we had said lead poisoning would be an example. Thalassemias can have basophilic stippling as well. And then the other one that was on this list that we didn't show a picture of is cabot rings. Again, they are made of that mitotic spindle, kind of like in a little figure eight. Um, we see that with megaloblastic anemias, like pernicious anemia especially. Okay, so let's discuss those hemoglobinopathy thalassemias a little bit. So this is what we call quantitative versus qualitative defects. Hemoglobinopathy is a qualitative defect because you are making enough, but what you're making isn't correct. So something has switched out and it's usually an amino acid has been replaced with a different one instead. So when they were making it, that hemoglobin, they switched out some amino acids and now you're making a totally different hemoglobin than normal. Um, so again, you're making enough of it, just not the correct one. So sickle cell anemia is the most common hemoglobinopathy that we see, whereas you have that hemoglobin S. We have already defined the hemoglobin S um, amino acid substitution, which is the glutamic acid replaced by valine in the sixth position of the beta chain. Hemoglobin C, that was the other one I said I would know for your boards, is glutamic acid replaced by lysine in the sixth position of the beta chain. So interestingly enough, it's occurring in the exact same spot as the hemoglobin S, it's just that in hemoglobin C, they have lysine, in hemoglobin S, they have valine. So that's what's the difference between them. And there is hemoglobin E disease. Um, I did put the substitution there. If you can't fit that in your memory, I wouldn't worry about it. All right, and then cephalosemias are a quantitative defect, meaning you're not making enough, you're missing some genes here. So you're not making enough of one chain or the other. Again, we name it for what chain was impacted. So beta thalassemias is all about the beta chains being impacted. So that would be your hemoglobin A is impacted because that's what contains beta chains. Hemoglobin A remembers two alpha, two beta. So in somebody who has a very severe major beta thalassemia, they probably would have hardly any hemoglobin A present. They would have a lot of hemoglobin F there, um, A2, but you wouldn't really, if you did hemoglobin electrophoresis, you wouldn't see much hemoglobin A because they can't make beta chains. So you got to keep that in mind because thalassemias are really confusing to people. If you remember what's missing and what hemoglobin molecule that affects, then you can kind of know what's not going to show up. So again, beta thalassemia is kind of three different categories. It could be minor, intermediate, or major. Major is the one where they're very transfusion dependent, very severe anemia. And then alpha thalassemia is affecting the alpha chains. Well, unfortunately, your alpha chains are found with all of our main normal adult hemoglobin. So hemoglobin A, A2, hemoglobin F all have alpha chains. So there's four categories here because it depends on how many of those A genes you are missing, those alpha genes you're missing. Silent carrier, you're only missing one. Trait, you're missing two, so it's getting a little bit more. Hemoglobin H now, you are missing three out of the four. And so you got a lot more severe of a disease happening now. And then finally, hydrops vitalis. They are missing all four alpha. Again, that baby cannot make it past the third trimester. It will be a stillborn. So what happens there is, while well, you have your whole hematopoiesis happening in that fetus, they have other hemoglobins in the beginning, like Gower, Portland, that kind of stuff that don't have alpha chains. So they have oxygen being supplied, they're making it. Then when it gets to the third trimester and it's supposed to switch over to hemoglobin F, which is two alpha, two gamma, now there's an issue. There's no alpha chains to get to hemoglobin F. As a result, they make hemoglobin BART. Hemoglobin BART is four gamma chains together. Does not work for oxygen delivery. So the fetus will die from lack of oxygen. Okay, some of the hemolytic anemias. We have hereditary spherocytosis. Again, that is an extravascular hemolysis process because we have spherocytes present. People who have hereditary spherocytosis have an abnormal protein in their cell membrane that causes shedding of that membrane off. As the membrane shuts off, it reseals itself and it makes a spherocyte. 
So what happens is they don't lose any of the stuff on the inside. They only lose part of the membrane. So when it reseals, it's now really rigid, compact ball because they have so much stuff on the inside, but little less surface membrane. So very inflexible, gets stuck in the small spaces in the spleen and hemolyzes. Um, one test we talked about here was osmotic fragility. That would be an increase or positive test. On a CBC, you would see your MCHC be high, so greater than 36, and that would indicate that there might be presence of spherocyte. I felt like I was gonna say something and I forgot what I was gonna say. Anyway, okay, I can't remember what I was just gonna say about it. Uh, going on, hereditary, oh, the main treatment for hereditary spherocytosis, that's what I was gonna say, is splenectomy because that it, they'll always have this, it's a hereditary condition. And overall, everything else is going fine and working well for them. So if we can limit how much hemolysis is happening, we can by removing the spleen. Because again, that's where most of their hemolysis is occurring is when these spherocytes are trying to fit through these spaces in the spleen. By taking out the spleen, you kind of remove that amount of hemolysis that is occurring. Okay, hereditary ellipsocytosis is another cell membrane protein abnormality. More than 30% of the red cells will be elliptical in shape. Again, can be hemolyzed because of the weird shape, not getting through spaces as well. PNH is proxismal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Um, this is the one that was named because upon waking in the morning, people would have you know, blood in their urine. This is not a hereditary condition. It is an acquired red blood cell membrane defect. So what's, um, I'm gonna type on this, but what is really happening here to go more in depth is there is a CD marker on their surface that is called CD55, and that is now missing in these red cells all of a sudden. Well, complement, which is part of your immune system, complement is to protect your immune system, will now target that those red cells because they view it as wrong. And so they target that red cell and destroy them. And that's the hemolysis part because complement is all about destruction to protect. So they now view those red cells as being not correct. And so they target it, destroy and lyse those red cells causing the hemolysis. So these, what, this is what we call very much complement susceptible. So that is the problem on how hemolysis is occurring, is those cells are now susceptible to that complement lysis. Some couple old school tests where this was the sugar water or the ham test to help confirm this. Again, those are pretty much obsolete, but I do contain them in here because again, you need to know them for boards. They haven't removed them off necessarily from boards. The newest gold standard for testing for this is flow cytometry. And again, flow cytometry looks for CD markers. And if we, since we now know CD55 is linked with causing this, you can use flow cytometry to measure and see if people have that CD55 present the way they should. Um, and if it's missing, then that's kind of their diagnosis. So that's kind of the new gold standard for it. All right, and then I had already mentioned G6PD deficiency. That's where you're missing that enzyme that's needed in the hexose monophosphate pathway to give us glutathione. Without that enzyme, you cannot make glutathione to protect the cells, and therefore they are susceptible to damage and lysis. You will again see those Heinz bodies be present here and bite cells. So as your cells filter through the spleen, macrophages will remove that abnormality, they will remove that Heinz body, but as a result, they'll look at me, it look like a bite cell, like a bite was taken out. Other hemolytic anemias, Maha group. Remember, this was a group of hemolytic disorders, and a lot of these are talked about in the COEG area. So you have your TTP, your HUST, and your DIC. The premise of why they're all grouped under this name Maha is again, you have clots occurring, especially in the smaller blood vessels. That's where the microangio means, small blood vessels. So you have clots building up in these smaller blood vessels and as the blood's trying to get by it, it shreds and lyses those blood cells as they're trying to get past the clots. So TTP has to do, see, I believe I have slides on all three of these in the coag area, so I'm gonna wait. If I don't, I'll come back and talk about them, but I believe I do. 
Um, and malaria, again, is and Babesia are both infections that can cause hemolysis. Malaria, parasite, and Babesia will use the red cells to help develop and reproduce themselves, and then they will destroy it in the end and keep doing that over and over again. So these are the list of those bone marrow failure disorders that I had referenced before with the apoptic anemia world. Um, we did a whole PowerPoint lecture on these. Um, so go back and kind of refresh. You don't need to know a ton about these. Um, some of them are pretty dang rare, but a little bit of brief notes on them. Myelocytic anemia is the one where you have malignant cells coming in and replacing your normal healthy cells in your bone marrow. The reason that's considered a bone marrow failure is because malignant cells don't function. They don't perform any of the jobs that they're supposed to do. And so that results in a bone marrow failure. Nothing is getting made anymore. Nothing is functioning anymore the way it should. Anemia of chronic renal insufficiency. So if you have chronic renal disease, basically, you can't make that urethra point hormone. Therefore, you can't make your red cell line in your bone marrow. And that's considered a failure of your bone marrow line, of your red cell line. Again, bone marrow doesn't mean that everything in the bone marrow fails all cell lines. It can, but it can also mean one cell line is failing, and that's still considered part of a bone marrow failure if you have one cell line that's affected. So in this case, it's affecting the red cell line since we can't get that erythropoietin. Aplastic anemia, again, we've already mentioned that. Um, it's just a lot of times we don't know why that's happening. It might be environmental things that they were exposed to, um, like radiation or something, or a drug they're taking, or if they can figure out why, discontinue it, and hopefully their bone marrow returns back to normal, and sometimes they just never figure it out. Fanconi anemia was an inherited aplastic anemia. So it is an inherited disease where they have abnormal stem cells. As a result of having abnormal stem cells, they can't produce the rest of their cells. Pure red cell aplasia, just like the name says, it is affecting the red cell line only. There is also an inherited form of this called diamond black band. Congenital dyserythropoietic anemia is also only affecting that red cell line. And then you have dyskeratosis congenita. So those last couple are kind of rare, but you can re-familiarize yourself with those. Okay, let's get into some leukocyte abnormalities now. Sorry, I had to take a drink. Okay. Toxic granulation and doli bodies are both found with severe bacterial infections. Um, toxic vacuolization of the neutrophils could also be with that, those two. So again, toxic granulation is where those primary granules become very heavily dark stained on the smear. Doli bodies are little round RNA inclusions in the cytoplasm. So again, both are linked with severe infection. Hypersegmented neutrophil is when that neutrophil has more than five lobes to its nucleus, so six or more lobes to the nucleus. We have already talked, that's linked with megaloblastic anemia. And then you have your four diseases here, Palger Hewitt, May Heglin, Chedia Kagashi, and Elder Riley. So Palger Hewitt is the one that's hypo-segmented, so the nucleus of the neutrophils are only two lobes, or sometimes even a single lobe. They're under-segmented. Um, no harm to the patient, um, they, their cells still function fine, so it's not very harmful to them to have this. But you'll notice on the smear that they have that, what they call pince nez appearance, or that bilobed look to the cells. May Heglin, do I, I feel like, do I slide on these? No, I didn't make a slide on these. I thought maybe I did, sorry. Um, May Heglin is a triad vector that you need to know. Um, where it has thrombocytopenia, giant platelets, and then inclusions that look like doli bodies. They're not doli bodies, not the true doli bodies, but they look very similar. They're a little bit more spindle shaped, um, but they look very similar. So it's kind of a trifecta that you need to remember for that May Heglin. And again, May Heglin results due to an abnormality in a gene, a mutation in a gene. Same with Chedia Kagashi, it's a mutation in a gene. And as a result, the lysosome granules in the neutrophils will fuse together and not function properly. So you, we all know neutrophils perform phagocytosis. As part of that phagocytic process, they have lysosomes that release out enzymes to destroy and kill the bacteria. 
when lysosomes fuse together in Chetty Kagashi, they don't do that anymore. As a result, those patients are very susceptible to bacterial infections, very life-threatening bacterial infections that they cannot kill off and destroy. So it's a very deadly disease. Um, a lot of times age, death by age 10. So you would see very large fused lysosomes in the neutrophils there. And then elder Riley is where they cannot break down the lipid mucopolysaccharide anymore. So it's what we say mucopolysaccharidosis, so a lot of extra lipid being held in that neutrophil. It will look like toxic granulation, but it is different. So it'll look like this big, heavily granulated cell um, looking like toxic gran, but it is different because it's the buildup of those mucopolysaccharide lipids because they can't break them down. Our two macrophage diseases that we discussed was Gaucher and Neiman Pick. Again, each one is missing an enzyme, which leads to it having increased lipids um, that should have been broken down. In Gaucher disease, they're missing that glucose cerebrosidase enzyme, so the Gs go together, glucose cerebrosidase for Gaucher. So they have a buildup of glucose cerebroside in their macrophage, which makes it look very unique. And I'll get to the appearance here in a second. And then Neiman Pick was missing the sphingomyelinase enzyme. So you have sphingomyelin lipid building up. And again, that whole thing was pick your sphincter to kind of remember the two go together. So both of them have a unique look. Out of these two pictures, which one is the Gaucher cell? So is the Gaucher cell the one on the left or the one on the right? Which one is the Gaucher cell? Yeah, it is the one on the right. So Gaucher cell is what we call the crumpled tissue paper look, or you can call it chicken scratch. Um, so the cytoplasm very much kind of looks like that crumple. If you crumple up tissue paper and then spread it back out. Neiman Pick has that foamy cytoplasm, the one on the left. I always think it looks kind of like vacuoles, but it's foamy, they call it. Okay, into our leukemias, our white blood cell main disorders here. Again, we categorize the leukemias if they're acute or chronic, and if they're lymphocytic or myelocytic. So depending on what cell lines are affected. On the lymphocytic side, it's just about the lymphocytes being affected, whether it's BT or B cell. On the myelocytic leukemias, that can mean all the rest of the cell lines. It could be the red cell line that's causing the leukemia. It could be the granulocytes. It could be monocytes, or it could be platelets that are involved in that leukemia. So they just term all of them under myelocytic. So acute and chronic, the biggest difference is the maturity of the cells. Acute has very immature cells, a lot of blast cells present. Um, to diagnose it as acute, who the World Health Organization says it has to be more than 20% and to be considered an acute leukemia, so more than 20% blast cells present. Chronic leukemia might have a few blast cells, but it's mainly other immature cells that are present in these. Okay, and then as part of getting to know these leukemias, we have stains that we learned. So it used to be cytochemical stains were all used a lot. They're probably used very much less now because flow cytometry kind of came in and took over in helping diagnose. But the whole premise behind this is when we have blast cells, you cannot tell which blast cell type it is to know what type of leukemia it is. You see a blast cell, you cannot tell me if it's a monoblast, a lymphoblast, or a myeloblast just by looking at it. So the process was you use stains, or now you use CD markers with flow cytometry to tell us what cells are affected here, then we know what type of leukemia is happening. So don't forget to relook at all these wonderful cytochemical stains. Um, so from myeloproxidase to down black B, those were both diagnosing AMLs. So acute myelocytic leukemias would be positive for those two. The esterases, there was a specific esterase and non-specific esterases, so they differed a little bit. The specific esterase would say in myeloblast type or myelocytic cells positive. Um, the non-specific would say monocytic cells positive. PAS, 
was a little unique. It was saying ALL positive and then the erythral leukemia. So just one specific type of AML would be positive here, not all the others. Lapsing again was to tell us if we have CML, so it would have a low score would be CML versus a leukemoid reaction, and that would have a high score. So that kind of helps separate between those two. And then trap stain, which is always so cute, is your hairy cell leukemia. Um, trap your hairy monster. Why can't everything be that easy to remember? All right, so just remember kind of what they are staining as positive, and that will kind of help you rule in and rule out what could be present. So we have all these lovely AMLs, the FAB classification, which doesn't really exist anymore, but again, we still learn it based on boards. Um, M0 through M7, these are the actual names. So they nicknamed them these. They are not lined up perfectly here. These don't go together side by side here. I have it as a matching little session. So I'm gonna pause the recording. I'll let you guys kind of look at this and see if you can figure out on your own first what ones are which. Don't put it down in the chat box yet and then we'll go through them together. Look at these. Okay. So let's see, I'm just gonna go ahead instead of having to flip back and forth to the chat box, I will just go ahead and kind of start working it and hopefully you can line up to see if your answers were right. So, First, before we get into this, I should say, as far as like symptoms and clinical findings for patients, a lot of their symptoms and stuff are similar in any leukemia. Um, you know, fatigue, anemia, low platelet count, things like that. And that's because the immature cells and the abnormal cells are kind of crowding out the ability to make healthy cells. So you always see a low red cell, low anemia and platelet, low platelet count a lot of times occurring. Um, okay, so M0, it's going to be AML with minimal differentiation. So that is M0. So by the name of that, AML with minimal differentiation means the cells are so young and immature, they're not even quite fully blast cells yet. So remember, as you make your cells from a hematopoietic stem cell to the CFU cells to a blast cell, they're just barely beginning to be a blast cell. Like they're very, very, very young. And so they're not even fully their blast cell self yet. That's how young they are. And as a result, no stains work on these. So all your stains will still be negative. Even your Sudan Black B and myeloproxase, which are supposed to stain AML positive, those would remain negative here just because they're such young cells. They're not even fully there yet. So in that, we're going to see over 90% of the cells be blast in that blast stage. So greater than 90% of the cells will be blast with AML with minimal differentiation. There'll be hardly anything else. M1 is going to be AML without maturation. So a lot of blast cells now still, so at least 80 to 90% of the cells are still blast cells. That's what it means without maturation, but they are kind of more their blast cell cells. So our stains will work. So your myeloproxidase stain, which is MPO, MPO is short for myeloproxidase. It will be positive. Your Sudan Black B stain will be positive here as well. And now we will see our rods show up. Remember, our rods are always found with AMLs, especially the first few, not all AMLs, but they are always a sign of an AML. And our rods are those fused together primary granules into a rod shape in the cytoplasm. So tons of blast still. But now you have stain reactions happening and our rods showing up. M2 is AML with maturation. So this is saying that you still have a ton of blasts, but now we have a little bit other stuff happening. So we might have 80% myeloblasts, but now we have some promyelocytes showing up, maybe some myelocytes showing up. So you got a little bit more stuff coming up. Again, your stain, um, stains will work here. And again, you still have our rods. Okay. M3 is acute promyelocytic leukemia. As the name tells you, it's all about the promyelocytes. Have a amount of promyelocytes will be seen on the smear and in the bone marrow. Your stains, again, still work. And you have our rods still present. In fact, these are the ones that have so many our rods present 
that they nicknamed those cells the faggot cells because it will look like bundles of sticks present in the cytoplasm. This is also the one that I wanted you to remember had that chromosomal translocation of 15 and 17, and that kind of helps create acute promyositic leukemia and also is prone to having DIC occur as a result of having this leukemia. So the thought is that all the granules that are in the promyocytes, so promyocytes are granulated, they are stimulating and kind of um, activating the coagulase, you know, functions and creating clots in the body. So these granules are releasing and activating your coag system and forming little clots throughout the body. And at first the patient doesn't know it. And again, as these clots form, all of a sudden now we don't have anything left and that's a DIC condition. So very much linked, but yes, you still should know the chromosomal abnormality that goes with acute promyelocytic leukemia is that translocation between chromosomes 15 and 17. Okay, M4 is gonna be your myelomonocytic leukemia. So we're kind of moving along on different cell lines here. Now we have both the myelocytic cells, like the promyelocytes, the myelocytes still happening, myeloblasts, but we also have monocytic line now coming into play. So we see some monoblast pro monocytes happening here. So it's kind of a hodgepodge mixture of both of them. Your esterase stains will work here because both cell lines are positive. So all the esterase stains may work here. M5 is going to be just involving your monocyte line now primarily. So more than 80% of the cells are going to be from the monocytic line. So your non-specific esterase stains are gonna work on this here. M6 is going to be your red cell line. Now we switch over to that line being affected. So acute erythroblastic leukemia, or you can call it erythral leukemia. This is the one that um, PAS stain works on. There is a specific type of, or an, name for urethral leukemia called D. Guglielmo syndrome, and that is part of that leukemia, so just a note there. And then finally, M7 is your megakaryocytic leukemia, so now affecting that megakaryocyte line, very rare leukemia, but that is M7. Okay, so that is kind of a review on our M numbers. Hopefully you guys kind of remembered them. Going into myeloproliferative disorders. So these were four disorders that we discussed all under the name myeloproliferative, meaning they are overly producing or making something. So CML is overly producing your granulocytes, basically. So it's all about the myelocytic granulocytes. Now remember, it's chronic, so it's not as many blasts, but it's more the myelocytes, metamyelocytes, increase in band. So it's what we call left shift so that's heavily happening. So you got a lot more band cells, metamyelocytes and myelocytes showing up on that smear. You will also see an increase in the other granulocytes. So a lot of eosinophils, a lot of basophils will be increased as well. Kind of a fun slide to look at. It's got some good variety. Um, very high white count. So the white count a lot of times sits up 80 to 100. If you were to do that lap stain or lap scoring system, again, you'll see a low lap score, so less than 20 for the lap stain score. And then predominantly we diagnose this through the Philadelphia chromosome. So 95% of people have the Philadelphia chromosome to be CML. So that chromosome is a translocation between what two chromosomes? Does anybody remember what the numbers are that are involved here for the Philadelphia chromosome? What and what? So we have a combo being right here. Yep, it's chromosomes nine and 22. Chromosome nine and 22 will make the Philadelphia chromosome. So again, 95% of people that have CML have the Philadelphia. We can see the Philadelphia chromosome in some ALLs a little bit as well, just so you know. But mainly we think of it for CML. Polycythemia vera is basically an overproduction of pretty much all cells. That's what polycythemia means, is poly for many. Um, 
site for Cell and Vera. Okay, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Sorry, I had to check something. All right, so it's overproduction of cells, so many cells. Um, the biggest thing is we see is like a lot of red cells. So as a result, there's hemoglobin and hematocrit go high as well because of so many red cells. So it's panpsychosis, everything is up. So on a case study, you would see high white count, high red count, high hemoglobin and hematocrit, high platelet count. So that's already starting to make you think of this. If you're to lap stain it, it would be a high lap count as well. The process of what happens to create polycythemia vera, and this is something that I didn't give you guys in the original lecture, but I'm giving it to you now for the boards. Again, you don't have to know this for Friday, Seth, but for the boards, I want you to know it, is there is a gene called the JAK2 gene, and it has mutated. That gene basically will help make a protein to regulate your blood cell production. If you mutate that gene, you can't make that protein to regulate you anymore, and that's why your production of cells is so out of control and so high for everything. That is what's the premise. There is different levels to polycythemia vera. There's the primary polycythemia vera, but there's also secondary polycythemia vera, that kind of thing. In primary polycythemia vera, that is what is happening, is that mutation. They will have a normal amount of erythropoietin hormone, but otherwise, for as far as, like, results on the CBC and all that, everything is increased. Essential thrombocytemia is all about the platelet world being affected. You will have an extremely high platelet count above 600, up around 1,000. Um, very poor platelet function, though, so they might have a lot of bleeding um, kind of things, like bleeding gums, you know, things like that, petechiae, stuff like that. Chronic idiopathic myelofibrosis is your overly producing fibrosis in the bone marrow, so you'll see a lot of collagen, things like that, so increased fibrosis in the bone marrow is how they diagnose it. In the blood, you will see what we call a leukoerythroblastic picture. So again, that term means that you have a left shift, so you have immature cells like band, metamyelocytes, myelocytes, and you have immature red cells, nucleated red blood cells showing up. So you would see both a left shift and nucleated red cells in the smear. Um, you will see some very weird shaped abnormal poikulocytes. Dacryocytes are very heavily seen with this. You could see a micromegakaryocyte show up in the blood as well. So some kind of interesting picture there, but to diagnose it, they would look for those, that increased fibrosis in the bone marrow. Myelodysplastic syndrome is a dyspoiesis of at least one or more cell lines, so a dysfunctional production of a cell line. So as a result of dysfunctional production, the cells look abnormal. They not, may not be granulated the way they should be, so like the neutrophils might be undergranulated. Um, they might have a weird shape to their nucleus upon trying to make them, so they kind of look weird. Our cells don't look right. And also it's cytopenia, so it's two main characters, dyspoiesis and then the cytopenia, meaning a low production. You know, you're not making cells right, you're not going to put them out there, so you get a cytopenia occurring. You will see microcytic hypochromic red cells, but you can also have a dimorphic field where you have other sizes present as well, creating this, you know, half of them are micro, half of them might be normal. You have oval macrocytes here. So again, we talked about oval macrocytes with megaloblastic anemia. The other diseases that they occur in is myelodysplastic. So there are five categories overall to it from refractory anemia, refractory anemia of ring blast, excess loss, CMML, and then Finally, any one of these five, if whatever one they have, can result and in transform into an acute leukemia. In that case, the prognosis for that patient is very poor. So again, in order to be considered transforming into that acute leukemia, at least 20% are blast. Refractory, remember that word itself means resistant to treatment. So these are very difficult um, diseases to treat, and they're it's not a good situation in general for these patients. They're a lot of times dependent on transfusion. So if their platelets get too low or their red cell, if they get too anemia, so they're dependent upon transfusion to help them maintain their cell line. Okay. Lymphomas. So lymphomas are all about lymphocytes. So B cells versus T cells. You got your B cells there and your T cells. T 
CLL is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Basically, 80 to 90% of cells should be lymphocytes. It's a fun count. You just hit that button over and over again. Mature looking lymphocytes. The other key feature to CLL was those smudge cells. And I'm just going to go back up. That was this picture here. So this was CLL right here. So you have two smudge cells that you can see right there. And the rest, look at all these lymphocytes in here to count. So, so fun. So again, smudge cells are basically when you go to make the smear, your lymphocytes are kind of more fragile in this. And so when you make the smear, they might smudge out some of those fragile lymphocytes. You can use albumin, like drops of albumin, to help strengthen your lymphocyte and then remake the smear. And that way you get a more accurate lymphocyte count. Because you can't count the smudge cells as a lymphocyte. They're not, they don't, you can't do that. You can definitely make sure you note down smudge cells seen um, and then add albumin, remake your smear, and then you can get a more accurate count. All right, so that's CLL. Hairy cell leukemia, again, is a chronic leukemia in which you see projections on the cytoplasm of those B cells. So they'll look hairy. Again, that's that trap stain is used to diagnose that. For kit lymphoma, um, it has been linked to that Epstein-Barr virus. Very high proliferation rate in the bone marrow, so it's a very um, Swiss lymphoma, if you will. Said to look like a starry sky pattern because they have so many cells, and then the macrophage cytoplasm looks like the stars. So the, all the cells make it look like a dark sky, and then the cytoplasm of the macrophage will look, look like the stars. I think they're stretching on that. <laughs> and then Hodgkin's lymphoma has those diagnostic Reed Sternberg cells. So that is a lymphocyte that has two nuclei. Normally, lymphocytes have one, but they have two nuclei, called, and that's what they call Reed Sternberg. That is very diagnostic to Hodgkin. T cell lymphoma is the Cesare syndrome. That is the one where you have the lymphoma cells or the Cesare cells that have a collected nucleus to them. So their nucleus kind of has a split down the middle. Um, you might have a skin fungal skin involvement here. So if it, you have a case study that talks about a fungal infection and it's asking about a lymphoma type situation, it probably is Cesare syndrome. Okay, let's go into our COEG. That was a big overview on the heme part. So COEG pathways. Oh. All right, you have extrinsic versus Intrinsic. I just got it. Hold on one second. I gotta make sure I can see my chat. <laughs> I just saw that. That's awesome. Your cat was walking on your keyboard. Oh, I love watching all those like TikToks. I like the cats like messing with people while they're working at home. That's so fun. Okay. Extrinsic and intrinsic coic pathways. Extrinsic is due to tissue injury. So upon injury, it releases out this factor three tissue factor, and it jump starts that. So it goes seven, 10, five, two, one, and then 13 to stabilize. Intrinsic is contact with a foreign object. It will start up the contact factors. Again, contact factors are 12, 11, pre-K and HMWK. I didn't put pre-K and HMWK on here, but they're very much part up there with 12. And then it goes 11, 9, 8, 10, 5, 2, 1, 13. Some key things that you need to remember, you have your vitamin K dependent factors known as the prothrombin group. That is made of factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. So 2 plus 7 is 9, 10 along for the ride. So 2, 7, 9, and 10 are all dependent on vitamin K. You have protein C and S. Those are responsible for inactivating five and eight. So that helps regulate our pathways. So once you start these coic pathways, something has to stop them. Otherwise, you're going to continuously make clots. So protein CNS is one way that we can kind of halt and stop our pathways. So this will go in and inactivate factors five and eight to help kind of halt that. Antithrombin will inactivate factors nine, 10, 11, and 12, and also will take out thrombin. Thrombin has a lot of roles in your body. Thrombin will actually activate factors 5, 8, 11, and 13. So by having this antithrombin neutralize that thrombin, you not only stop the 9, 10, 11, 12, you're also stopping 5, 8, 11, and 13. 
So it's very good at regulating your pathway there. And then tissue factor pathway inhibitor inactivates factor seven, which is only found in that extrinsic pathway. So that will help the extrinsic pathway and stop it from continuously going. So we had coag testing. These are all screening type tests. I'm sure you guys did a zillion PT, PCTs. That's what everybody does in coag area. And if you work in a really large facility, you probably have some other fun tests um, that aren't even, that maybe we haven't even discussed. I know there's ones out there that we never even brought up in COEG when we learned it. But let's review what each of these is screening for. Who knows what prothrombin time assesses? What does prothrombin time assess out of these choices on the right? I gave you five choices on the right. The prothrombin time. Yes. <laughs> so out of the choices, that's okay. On this slide, um, your choices are over here on the right. Out of those, what does prothrombin time assess? Why do we use prothrombin time? What are we looking at out of those choices? All right. So we have a few answers. So prothrombin time is looking at the extrinsic pathway. So this one is the extrinsic. APTT is your intrinsic pathway. So the way that I remember that is PT is a shorter name, it does the shorter pathway. APTT is a longer name, it does the longer pathway. Your thrombin time itself is assessing your conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. So that is assessing that. Bleeding time is all about platelet function. And then finally, your urea solubility is looking at factor 13. Because again, factor 13, even though it stabilizes the clot in both pathways, it is not measured by PT or APTT. So if we want to look at factor 13, we can do a urea solubility test. All right, mixing studies was something that we talked about as more of a confirmatory type test. So if you were to run a PT and a PCT, and one or both are abnormal, one thing that they could do is use mixing studies to help kind of figure out, okay, what's causing the abnormality? Now, these aren't done that much anymore. There's a few places that still do them, but again, you still have to know them. So you have different substances here. You have serum aged plasma or adsorbed plasma that you can mix with the patient's sample and rerun the PT and PTT and see if it fixed the problem. So you have to memorize what's in each of these. Serum will have the factors 7, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So 7, 9 through 12, and it's missing all the other factors. Age has all factors in it except 5 and 8. It is missing 5 and 8. Absorbed plasma will have factors 1, 5, 8, 11, and 12. It is missing the prothrombin group. It is missing 2, 7, 9, and 10. So first, you got to kind of remember that. Then on how to use this to solve your problem. So again, if we mix it and it corrects, then it has, it contains the factor that is missing in that patient. If it does not correct, then that patient is still is missing that factor. That's why it didn't correct, it didn't fix it. So I know it's kind of a trickier concept, but we're gonna practice it. So, I don't know what you guys can see and what you can't hear. I need to type, but I don't want to make it too small. Hopefully you can. So on example one, we're going to do together. So just kind of bear with me here. So on example one, they ran the PT as normal and the PTT was increased. So the very first thing you're going to do is narrow down well, what's in the PTT test that's only there and not in the PT? Because only the PTT has an issue. 
So that would be factors 12, 11, 9, or 8. Those are the only four that are found in PTT that are not in PT. So we can roll it down because we're ignoring the HMWK and Pre-K. Don't worry about those here. So we can roll it down to those four as being suspects of what's causing the issue. Okay, now that we've done that, we can go to our mixing studies. So serum, remember, has seven, nine, can't type, of course, 10, 11, and 12. So serum corrected it, meaning it has the missing factor. So whatever the patient is deficient in, it has it. So you can rule out anything that was not in the serum. So since serum corrected it, it has to have, be one of these that it had. Well, let's look at our things. 12, 12 is there, 11 is there, nine is there, oh, eight. It didn't have eight, so it wasn't gonna fix that. So we can rule that out. And go to aged. Aged, again, has all but five and eight. Those are the two missing. So again, age corrected it here in this example one. So it has to be in aged. So again, 12, 11, and nine are all in aged. So that works. Again, we could have just ruled out eight because that was missing from there. So that wouldn't have fixed it. Adsorbed. No correction. So again, absorbed has one, five, eight, eleven, and twelve. It takes me a while on absorbed. Remember, it is missing two, seven, nine, and ten. Okay, so this is our first one that had no correction, meaning it is missing. So because adsorbed did not fix the problem, it means it has to be one of the factors that is missing from that adsorbed concoction. So it has to be either two, seven, nine, or 10. Well, what up here matches with that? Let's see, 12 and 11 aren't part of that, but nine is. So it has to be factor nine that the patient is missing. So again, to review, they ran the PT and the PTT, only the PTT was increased. If that patient is missing factor nine, that would cause an increased PTT because it's not working. It was supposed to be there. And if you go through factor nine is in serum, is in age. So that's why they fixed it. They gave back that factor nine the patient was missing and now the, it worked. In adsorbed, it's still missing it. That's why there was no correction. It didn't work because it was still missing it. All right, I know sometimes my explanations are hard to follow. Like this is just sometimes a hard concept until you keep practicing it over and over and over again. So now with that being said, let's have you guys, I'm gonna pause the recording and let's have you guys do example two together. I'm gonna, does anybody wanna share what they think it was? You don't have to if you don't feel confident. Yeah, it was five. Good, Heather. Thank you for sharing. Things are being bold. Yes, it was factor five here. So let's take a look at it. For example, two, your PT is increased and your PTT is increased. So right away, first thing you do is figure out, okay, what are our suspects? So when both pathways are abnormal, it has to be a common pathway factor, which are 10, five, two, and one. Those are your common pathway factors. So it has to be one of those four because it's causing a problem with both tests. So serum, there was no correction. So you can rule out anything that was in serum because it didn't fix it. So it can't be seven, nine, 10, 11, or 12. So we can rule out 10 on that. Um, age had no correction. So again, you can rule out anything that was in aged because it didn't fix it. So age has everything except five and eight. So you can rule out one and two, they're in aged. It didn't fix it, so it wasn't them. So you actually already have your answer. It is factor five, but we can go down to absorbed. Absorbed corrected it, meaning it had to be in there. It had to contain it. Well, absorbed does contain factor five. So 
it is factor five. Good. All right, go ahead and do the third one. Um, I'll pause it. I won't pause it for as long this time, but yeah, go ahead and do the third one. Well, hold on one second. Okay. Does anybody have an idea of what they think it is? Yeah, good. It was eight. Yes, very good, you guys. So let's go through it again. Um, PT normal, PTT increased. So again, it is only a factor in the PTT pathway. So it's either 12, 11, 9, or 8. So those are our choices. So serum, no correction, meaning it was missing. So it can't be anything that serum does have. It can't be any one of these because it didn't fix it. So you can rule out 12, you can rule out 11, you can rule out 9. Well, oh, shoot, you already have your answer. It's 8. <laughs> But if you keep going, aged did not correct. So again, it has to, it can't be anything that was in age. That still makes sense though, because eight is missing from age. And then adsorbed did work, so it could be something that was in there, and eight is in adsorbed. So yeah, you could actually answer that with the first one. Very good. Now everybody's a little bit different on these. Um, some people like to look at the corrected results first before the no corrected. You know, whatever works for you. Okay, let's keep going on practicing. So example one here, PTs increased, PTTs increased, serum agents or had no correction. What do you think is the problem? I'm not gonna pause this on this one. What do you think is the problem here? Very good. It is probably an inhibitor. Anytime that you have an abnormal pathway, whether it's PT, PTT, or both, and none of your mixing studies work, all of them will not correct, it's probably an inhibitor instead of an actual enzyme deficiency. Good. So anytime your mixing studies never correct, it's an inhibitor. And example two, your PT is normal, your PTT is normal. But if I told you, you had to have a deficiency of a factor, one of your factors is still deficiency, but both tests are normal. What factor could possibly be deficient that would not impact those tests? Yeah, factor 13. So again, factor 13, somebody could be missing factor 13 and their test would still work. Their PT, their PTT would show normal but because they're not assessing factor 13. Factor 13 is not being measured by those tests. If you did that urea solubility though, you could see that. And then example three, your PT is increased, your PTT is normal, serum corrected, age corrected, adsorbed, did not correct. So what factor is the problem here? And just to give you a hint, you shouldn't even need to really do the mixing studies. If you did, you'll find it, but. What do you think is the problem factor? So yeah, it would be factor seven. So again, when only the PT is increased and the PTT is normal, then you got to roll it down and say, okay, what's the only factor that's in PT that's not in PTT? And that's seven. Seven is the only factor found in PT that's not in the other pathway. So it has to be seven, that's the problem. Okay. Some disorders that we need to go through here for coag. You have von Willebrand disease in which you are missing von Willebrand's factor, it's low. Um, again, your von Willebrand factor has two functions. The main function is platelet aggregation, or platelet adhesion, excuse me, platelet adhesion, so helping platelets adhere to the site of injury. And then it also carries and stabilizes factor eight. So von Willebrand disease, like with test results, you see a lot impacted with platelet stuff. Um, and then if it was low enough, it can impact the factor eight and the intrinsic pathway. Um, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Depends on how low it really is. 
Hemophilia, you have those A, B, or C. So again, hemophilia A is eight, hemophilia B is nine, hemophilia C is 11. They are all X-linked inherited disorders, so they mainly affect males. Um, deep joint bleeding, deep muscle bleeds. We're not talking surface bleeding with hemophilia, we're talking about deeper bleeds. Again, there should be a history of bleeding with patients that have a hemophilia as well in your case study. And so you would see a deficiency in one of these three, depending on which one they have. And then DIC, again, is never a disease on its own. It's occurring because of whatever else the patient has going on. Maybe it's a leukemia, a complicated pregnancy, sepsis, something else is happening that has resulted in them starting DIC. So DIC is where they have clots throughout the body and at first it's not noticeable, but then it results in one big life-threatening hemorrhage because they've used up all their stuff in their making of the clots. So pretty much all your coag results would be abnormal with DIC. Okay, so if I give you results here on the right, you have increased CT, increased CTT, increased thrombin time, decreased fibrinogen, increased lean time, decreased platelet count. Which of the options is these test results belong to? Which one would these go with? So it would most likely be DIC. So everything kind of got out of whack there. And that's because we've used up all the stuff in making those clots. So there's really nothing left. You know, your fibrinogen is used up to make clots, so that's low levels. Platelets are all used up in those clots, so that's low levels. So if you were trying to measure your platelet function, well, there's nothing there to measure. So that goes increase. And same with your coag enzymes or coag proteins. They're not there, so everything is increased on that list. Okay, what about these test results? Normal PT, increased PTT, normal drama time, normal platelet count, and normal bleeding time. Which option goes best with that? Okay, so with this one, remember von Willebrand disease has a lot to do with platelets. Bleeding time would not stay normal because in von Willebrand disease, if you're low in that, in that von Willebrand factor, you don't have platelet adhesion, you don't have normal platelet function then, and bleeding time measures the function. Your platelet count would be normal, but your bleeding time would not remain normal because that's measuring the platelet function. So it cannot be von Willebrand disease. So the last one left, of course, here is hemophilia. And hemophilia only has to do with factors 8, 9, or 11. It's one of those, and those are all found in PTT tests. So that would increase. Nothing else would be affected on that. Okay, some platelet disorders. Remember, if you are low or have abnormal platelet function, you will have mucocutaneous bleeding, so like petechiae, purpura, ecchymosis, which is a nosebleed, that's, that's a bruise, and then epitaxis, which is the nosebleed. Um, you can have bleeding gums, so you kind of have surface bleeding happening. There are things called platelet aggregation studies in which you can mix different substances with the platelets and see how they respond. One substance you can mix is ristocetin. Ristocetin is a cofactor for von Willebrand factor, so basically they just go together. They are a cofactor. So any time that you do not respond to ristocetin, your platelets are not responding, it's because you have an issue with von Willebrand factor. You either are deficient in von Willebrand factor itself, or you are missing the receptor for von Willebrand factor, which we see in Bernard Soulier syndrome. Something's wrong with that, so that they go together. So anytime ristocene is an issue, von Willebrand factor is an issue. Okay, so some quantitative platelet disorders. ITP is idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. 
There is an acute ITP, which is seen more in children, um, and a chronic ITP, which is more in adults. It's been heavily linked to happening after a viral infection, especially in children. Um, the thought process is that they made antibodies to fight off that infection, and now these antibodies are impacting your platelets and destroying them, so resulting in a low platelet count. This will go away on its own, especially for kids, um, spontaneous remission. So you just kind of have to monitor the platelet level to make sure it doesn't dip too low, but yeah, it'll just kind of go away. Thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, TTP. Again, I mentioned this was a Maha earlier. The actual issue here, and again, I did not teach you this in the normal lecture, but I'm gonna add it in for your board, is you have a decrease in what we call Adam TS13. The purpose of that is to regulate your von Willebrand factor size. The larger your von Willebrand factor, the more likely you are to cause clot because von Willebrand factor helps adhere platelets. So then the more likely they're gonna do that and form these clots in the smaller blood vessels because that's the whole process of Maha's uh, is clots in smaller blood vessels. So in TTP, because they have this decrease in this, they're not monitoring their sizing and function of the von Willebrand factor and then they're prone to making clots. Some things that are linked with it besides having a little platelet count is renal, a little bit of renal failure, not as severe as HUS, and then those neurologic abnormalities. And so again, it just depends on where those clots are residing in the body and what they're impacting then as a result. No coag stuff will be abnormal here. No PT, PTT, all that will remain normal, it's just the platelets that are more affected. Hemolytic uremic syndrome is, again, another type of MAHA. This heavily occurs after E. coli 0157 or Shigella food poisoning because of that toxin. They both have what we call the Shiga toxin that is found in both of those bacteria. That Shiga toxin will go into the small blood vessels and destroy them. It also helps make clots, you know, form. You have thrombocytopenia, and in this case, you have a lot of severe renal failure, and that's because of the kidney vessels are heavily affected um, because platelets and red cells, and then they clog up the glomeruli the filters, so it's a whole thing. So it has, especially seen in younger children, linked with that food poisoning. Your qualitative disorders, the two we learned about here is Bernard's cilia and glanzman thrombocenia. Each was missing a platelet receptor. In Bernard Soulier, they are missing the receptor 1B95. That is the receptor for von Willebrand factor. So again, you might have normal levels of von Willebrand factor present, but if they can't bind to the platelets, it can't help the platelets do its job then. So you do see an abnormal response to risocetin. Like I said, anytime there's an issue of von Willebrand factor, your risocetin will not work. Low platelet count, giant looking platelets, and then increased bleeding time because, again, the platelets can't bind that von Willebrand factor to do the adhering that they need to do. Glanzman thrombocenia, you're missing the platelet receptor 2B3A. That is the platelet receptor responsible for fibrinogen. Fibrinogen does play a role of platelets in aggregation and the clumping of them. So you will see an abnormal response to most of the platelet aggregation study stuff like ADP, epinephrine, collagen, all those will be abnormal because again, you can't do platelet aggregation if you're missing that fibrinogen receptor. But your risocene would remain normal because your von Willebrand factor is not affected over on this one. So that will remain normal, all the rest will be abnormal. You'd also see an abnormal in vitro clot retraction, but you'll have a normal platelet count. You still have that increased bleeding time because it is still affecting the platelet aggregation and function there. And calculations, I know I did not state the calculations allow. You should know how to find them. You should know them. Things to know, especially for your boards, hemocytometer counts, that's for both your analysis and for us. I think you learned that. Did you guys go over that in your analysis at all? Maybe you didn't do it in your analysis at all, but you should know um, body fluids sometimes are used on hemocytometer counts. That's why I was thinking of your analysis is for the body fluids. But a hemocytometer calculation, how to correct the white count if you have nucleated red cells present, how to still calculate the MCV, MCH, MCHC, white cell and platelet estimates, retic count, absolute count. So like if I were to say, what's the absolute neutrophil count? Can you do that? Same with absolute retic count. And then the corrected retic count is their hematocrit is too low. 
So still be familiar there. Fit as many of those in your brain as you can. If I had to rule out any of them, I'd rule out the last one. I can't fit that in my brain very well sometimes. But do what you can on those. Okay, now let's flip over to our other PowerPoint, which is going to be filled up with case studies and questions. So these are going to be a lot more I need you to help answer. So let me pull up. Okay, let's go through each of these case studies. So we have a pale and listless 18-month-old boy that is seen in a clinic that serves the homeless. His mom reports that she is still nursing him to save money. So looking at the test results on the left there, which one stand out as being abnormal? You can just list out a couple that you see that are not normal. And this sucks because they have to flip back and forth. So I apologize if it changes your view. Yeah, hemoglobin is definitely low. Hematocrit is very low. So we definitely seen anemia occurring here with the hemoglobin and hematocrit being low. Um, platelet count is high. Yep, I saw somebody mention that. MCV is very low. RDW is high, yes. So, okay. So we definitely see some issues here. We have an anemia occurring. We have a low MCV, a high RDW, high platelet count, and then of course there was some abnormal shapes and stuff on the mirror. What type of anemia fit into this category? So if you have a microcytic MCV, what are the different anemias that we talked about that are microcytic? What anemias come to mind as being microcytic? Yep, iron deficiency is definitely microcytic. What other ones are microcytic? Anemia, chronic inflammation is, yes. Hemolytic is normocytic, so that one wouldn't fit here. But good guess. Um, sideroblastic anemia would be another one. Thalassemia is another one. Those are all microcytic anemias, all right. Going to the third question, based on the background and the test results, what do you think is, what anemia is it? And if it, you think it's that anemia, what would you use to diagnose it or confirm it? What test would you run? Yes, I would want to see some iron studies as well. So most likely this patient is having iron deficiency anemia because of the fact that um, he's probably not getting enough iron or nutrients, maybe if she's just nursing him and they're homeless. Um, so maybe they're just not getting in the best nutrients there. So most likely iron deficiency, but to confirm it, we would definitely want to run those iron studies. But yeah, the mom's diet definitely is playing a role. Case study two. A 40-year-old white male presented to the ER complaining of sh shortness of breath, SOB, and cough. He has revealed that he had undergone an aortic valve replacement two years earlier. So first, let's look at his test results. Anything stand out to you as being abnormal there? So, yeah, what's going on this time? Oh, I will answer you, Heather, um, in a second here. Yeah, red cell hemoglobin are low, so hematocrit is low, so definitely an anemia happening. MCV, MCH, MCHC, all those indices are normal, so it's well, I answered question two already. I forgot I had asked that separately. That is, so it is normocytic, normal chromic red cell morphology. So I answered number two for us. Um, RDW, barely high, not really. I would just ignore that. Platelet count is normal. And then of course we have some issues going on on the smear with polychromasia and schistocytes. 
So we have a normal sitting, normal chromic red cell morphology. See some of the test results here. So definitely anemia and then some issues with the red cell morphology. What type of anemia is most likely occurring? Just given that. Again, be thinking about what's in your normocytic, normochromic category of anemia. Yep. So, yes, a couple of you have said it already. Hemolytic anemia. So, again, hemolytic anemia is a normocytic anemia, and that would see schistocytes in it. So, schistocytes are a sign of hemolysis. The other one here, polychromasia. That is telling us there's increased retics present. So polychromasia always kind of indicates there's more reticulocytes there. Um, so and again, increased retics go with hemolysis. So that also works together. And so yep, all the rest of this picture fit that hemolytic anemia. So if it's an intravascular hemolytic anemia, because again there's schistocytes, so it should probably be more intravascular based. And I'm sure what's happening is his red cells don't like that aortic valve replacement and they're shredding in the bloodstream as a result. What other test results would you expect to see or what other characteristics would you expect to see here with this? Yep, so we did see those fragmented cells, the schistocytes. We could also see keratocytes potentially. What else? What are those main characteristics of intravascular hemolysis? Increased bilirubin, yep, we see that. So the other things that I was looking for, um, and maybe I was hard to, wasn't wording my question right, was hemoglobinemia, hemoglobinuria, hemosiderinuria, definitely see the increased bilirubin, um, things like that. So that's kind of what I was looking for there. So yeah, all that would kind of be seen here with this. Um, before I move to the next time, I'm gonna go back, because I did mean to mention this, I did, and I saw the question on it. In that first case study on iron deficiency, the platelet count was high. A lot of times with iron deficiency anemia, and you guys kind of watch for it when you get in your careers and you have somebody, their platelet count tends to be high with iron deficiency. And I think I looked it up once, and what they said is they're not really always sure of why. At the time when I looked it up, this was the answer I found. It's kind of unknown why, but their platelets, a high platelet count tends to go with iron deficiency anemia. It just so I might have to dig back into that and see if I can figure out the exact theory behind it. But I know at the time when I did it, it was a, it was years ago now I looked it up. Um, at the time it was just, it was kind of unknown, but they always just seem to have a higher platelet count with iron deficiency. So it was something that you see commonly with that. So kind of keep an eye out when you guys are in your, like working, if you work in heme ever and you have somebody that you know is iron deficient, see if their platelet count is slightly high. Okay, going to case study three, a 10 month old boy of Italian descent was referred to a pediatrician because of recurring infection. He was listless and underdeveloped for his age. His liver and spleen were enlarged. So looking at it as the results, what do you see as abnormal? Yeah, hemoglobin, hematocrit, very much. MCV, MCH, MCHC, good. RDW, 
Platelets are pretty normal here. I would leave platelets as normal. They're on the lower end of the reference range, but I'd say they're still normal. Yeah, very high RDW, good. So basically, almost everything is abnormal on these results, especially the rectal morphology. Besides, I'd say platelets are still pretty okay. His right count might be also okay still. I'd have to look up the exact range on that. But everything else is out. Okay, what is the red cell morphology that is present here when you look at the red cell indices? What's the morphology? Yeah, it is microcytic hypochromic, very much low MCV, low MCHC, so microcytic hypochromic. So you're already starting to think about your microcytic category of stuff. Now, when you look at the red cell morphology, we didn't talk a lot about this. We see a lot of different shapes, mesocytosis to go along with that high RDW, basophilic stippling, tons of target cells and nucleated red cells. They did do any hemoglobin electrophoresis and they saw they had a lot of hemoglobin F and a lot of hemoglobin A2, or not a lot. Well, an increased amount of hemoglobin A2, but a ton of hemoglobin F. Considering all of this, and it's microcytic in that category, what do you think is a possible diagnosis here? All right, nobody else is jumping in. It is a thalassemia, but it's actually a beta thalassemia. So, but very good. Thalassemia is actually tricky. So, the reason I know it's a beta thalassemia, not an alpha, is what's present on the electrophoresis. Again, beta chains are found in hemoglobin A, because that's two alpha, two beta. And you'll notice this patient has no hemoglobin A present, which will go with a beta thalassemia major. Um, Alpha chains are found in hemoglobin F, hemoglobin A2. They both already have alpha chains. So they're, they're still present in OK. So that kind of tells me it's got to be beta thalassemia because there was no hemoglobin A made at all. Um, and again, it is a thalassemia. Thalassemias are microcytic, so that fits there. Very low hemoglobin, depending on how severe of a thalassemia they have. All of the stuff in the rectal morphology supports a thalassemia. That is all seen with thalassemias. And then his background, ancestry, Italian descent. Thalassemias do tend to go along with Mediterranean heritages, um, you know, kind of that region as well. So that does go together too. Okay, going into the next one. A 60-year-old female was seen in an outpatient clinic. She reported feeling weak, lightheaded, and shortness of breath. She had been experiencing numbness and tickling of her extremities. Her tongue was sore and appeared beefy red. What test results are normal here? Okay, so we have white cell, red cell, hemoglobin, B indices, platelets. Yeah, a good bunch of stuff here. So white cell is a little bit yep, low, red cell is low, hemoglobin marker low, RDW is high, platelet is low, and then you have the red cell morphology. All right, what red cell morphology is present? So what would you categorize this red cell morphology as? Yep, it is macrocytic normal chromic. So the MCV is high, so that's macrocytic, and then MCHC is still normal, so normal chromic, macro normal. 
Um, just based on what we have so far and what we see in the rectal morphology, which is some poikilocytes, oval macrocytes, target cells, anisocytosis, along with these test results, what type of anemia do you think is most likely happening? Good. Yeah, it is most likely a megaloblastic anemia. So, again, with megaloblastic anemias, um, you can't really make DNA very well. So, you do see a pancytopenia, and we see that represented here, as Aubrey said, white, low white count, low red count, low platelet count. So, that's pancytopenia. Macrocytic and, in fact, oval macrocytes, as they mentioned here, definitely goes with megaloblastic anemia. So, all of that kind of goes together. Um, since we're looking at megaloblastic anemia, what other cell abnormality would be present that isn't mentioned yet here? What other thing could be present then in this patient that we didn't mention? Yeah, so hypersegmented neutrophils. So that wasn't just mentioned down here as anything seen on smear, but you would want to note that if you were to start seeing hypersegmented neutrophils. Good. So what do we use to confirm what specifically they have for megaloblastic anemia or to confirm that it is a megaloblastic anemia? What test could we run? But, yep, I would want to measure the vitamin levels. That's easy to do. It's just a blood draw. So I'd want to measure the folate and the vitamin B12 and see if one of those is deficient. You could also do like other testing. So if you think it's a B12 deficiency, then they could move on to see, okay, are they deficient in B12 because they're just not getting enough in or do they have pernicious anemia where they're missing their intrinsic factor? So then you can look at doing like the shilling test and stuff like that. So you can move on to do other testing too to confirm. Um, up in the symptoms here, that whole numbness and tingling of extremities, like a peripheral neuropathy, does go along with B12 deficiency, especially same with the tongue thing. So that is seen with that. Okay, a six-year-old girl was seen by a physician during a routine annual checkup. She was slightly jaundiced and spleen was enlarged. So I'm gonna help answer the first one here just for time's sake. So we see normal white count, and you guys have been doing good at pinning out this test. Low red, low hemoglobin, low hematocrit, so we definitely have that anemia happening. MCV is low, so it would be microcytic. MCHC is high, so hyperchromic. High RDW, normal playlist, and then you see your red cell morphology. So once you see all these results, what test would you want to perform next? Yeah, you could perform a retake count. It probably would show us high. Um, yeah, definitely indicating the bone marrow is responding to some hemolysis. Osmi uh, fragility would be a good one. So the presence of the spherocytes and the increased MCHC, which goes with the presence of spherocytes, osmi fragility would help here too. What do you think is the overall diagnosis? Yeah, most likely hereditary spherocytosis. She is pretty young, so it's probably something inherited. The spleen being enlarged, again, that's because as those spherocytes travel through, they get hemolyzed, 
in the spleen, so kind of all of that happening in the spleen will enlarge it to splenomegaly. Um, so that does go along with it as well. Okay, good. An 80 year old man was admitted to the hospital with a broken hip. What test results are abnormal? Um, just give me a couple of jumbo to you right away. Uh, oh, Sophia, I see your request statement. The MCHC is not that high. Anything about 36 is considered high. So it was like 36.9, I think, on that. So yeah, it was it wasn't hugely high, but it was definitely increased. I see what you're saying. All right, Heather's saying on this one, white cell, red cell, hemoglobin, hematocrit. Yeah. So when you look at this case, that white count is huge, 220. Wow. Can you imagine doing that under the smear on, on the microscope? That would take you like two fields and you'd be done. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> you'd be so fast. So not only is the white count huge, you also have definitely an anemia happening, a lot of low red count hemoglobin and hemocrit dropping quite low. All the red cell indices are normal. Platelets are slightly low. 85% lymph. That would be a fun count. <laughs> I like counts like that. All right. When you look at all these test results, what do you think is the diagnosis? Like, what is your initial thought, though, and what's occurring here? Not from the break. I think what's happened here is he came in for a broken hip and then they're discovering something else is really happening with this patient. Um, you would have increased white counts with a break like that, but not up to 220. That is definitely going with like a leukemia. So Sophia said CLL, ALL, both are great thoughts. Um, definitely a leukemia is probably happening. And with 85%, that's why she was saying CLL or ALL is a lymphocytic based leukemia. Now, there's no blast cells here. And then if I were to tell you, they also saw smudge cells on the smear. Now, what is your diagnosis? So they saw smudge cells as well. Yeah, CLL. CLL, again, is a chronic lymphocytic leukemia, so almost all the cells are going to be mature lymph. There won't be really any immature cells happening, um, and then smudge cells definitely are always correlating with that CLL. Good. A 46-year-old woman was admitted to the hospital with complaints of fatigue, malaise. Malaise just means she doesn't feel good. Severe pain on her left side. So when we look at the test results, I'll do these ones. White cell count, again, hugely high, very anemic. Red cell, hemoglobin, hematocrit, extremely low. MCV indices are all normal. RDW is high. Platelet is very, very low. And then you look at the cells present, 86% blast, 5% promyelocytes. Um, you have a few nuclear red cells, some hoik, and then our rods were present. What is your first thought on what is happening, like, or what type of, so we know it's probably a leukemia, right? What type of leukemia do you think is going on here? Yeah, so those hour rods are always linked with AML. So right away we know it's an AML-based leukemia because the hour rods are present. With it being 86% blast, so mainly blast cells, very little other types of cells, and hour rods, I would say this is probably M1. M1, again, is AML without maturation. So again, they will have hour rods there. Um, they'll have mainly blast cells only present. Could have been M2. It, you know, it's a toss-up between. 
what other tests would aid in confirming the diagnosis? So what else could we run? Full cytometry, definitely. Um, Laugh, no, that's more used for CML. So good thought. But yeah, flow cytometry is good. Let's see what CD markers are present because that'll help us determine the exact what's happening. Yeah, Sudan Black B, myeloproxidase stains could both be here. Um, those should be positive for this. Yep, all those are good thoughts. All right. And then, of course, you can always bring in cytogenetics because there's so many different chromosome abnormalities that could happen that are linked to different leukemias. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so I didn't have any questions with this one. I always forget that I did that. So we're just gonna look at the test results. So we see a high white count, um, a little bit of a low red count, but otherwise pretty healthy hemoglobin hematocrit. Nothing in the indices. Uh, platelet count is slightly high. Now you look at your cells present. What's your first instinct on the diagnosis here? Just looking at this differential. Yeah, so it's probably a CML, and it looks classic like a CML. Um, with CML, you get a high white count, and you have a lot of, like, some immature cells, like what we call a left shift, but not, like, super immature. So you only see there's, like, two blasts. So right away, we know it's more chronic than acute. And then, again, you have that left shift, so, so increased bands, like 25% bands, some metamyelocytes, myelocytes. Increase in granulocytes, so you see increased EOs, increased basophils, those both go along with CML as well. Good. So all of this is probably a CML. All right. A three-year-old girl was taken to the pediatrician after several days of fever and vomiting. She had petechiae in her face and trunk and was very pale. Test results. So we see a pretty normal white count, a little bit elevated, not a ton. It is a little elevated. Red cell anemia, not happening a ton here. You know, I don't know exactly the reference range offhand for a three-year-old, but might be a little bit low. MCV stuff is good. RDW is pretty good. Not too bad. And then 90% blasts are happening, 10% lymphs, nothing else really. First thoughts on this case. What is your initial thoughts on what you think it is? Yeah, this is probably an ALL. So again, it is an acute leukemia because of all the blasts. The other, the clue here is the age range. In two to 10 year olds, if there's a leukemia, it's most likely ALL. That's the prevalent age range for ALL. Of course, we don't know for sure. We just know it's definitely an acute leukemia. Cytochemical results, if it is ALL, what would your cytochemical stains be? Like what would show up for a stain for ALL? All right, PAS, yes, would be positive. Myeloproxase, Sudan, Black B would both be negative because they go with AML. So for ALL, PAS would be positive. Good, okay. 
A 25 year old woman experiences abnormal bleeding after oral surgery. She remembers bleeding following a tonsillectomy when she was a child and she birthed a history of easy bruising, frequent nosebleeds, heavy menstrual bleeding. Shows that her mom is a bleeder as well. PT is normal, PTT is normal, platelet count is normal, but her platelet function test is abnormal. What are some possible thoughts here? Yeah, so I'd be thinking about von Willebrand disease as well. So again, von Willebrand disease can be inherited. So that's what she means by reporting that her mom is a bleeder. So now we're indicating not only maybe a familial history, but she also has history throughout her life of stuff. So we kind of have some bleeding history. So knowing, oh, it could be inherited. We hear the mom might be a bleeder. So we're already thinking maybe it's inherited. And then when you look at the test, we know it cannot be anything related to the coid proteins, like the pathways, because the PT and PTT are normal. So you can rule out it's not hemophilia because that would involve a pathway. You know, it's not anything to do with the factors being deficient because those are all fine. We know it has to be so the platelets though. And so von Willebrand factor would definitely affect the platelet count. Um, other one could be maybe it was Bernard Soulier syndrome as well or something, but you know, initially I'm thinking von Willebrand disease. A 15 year old boy bled excessively following extraction of his wisdom teeth and was referred for evaluation. He had not had any other bleeding episode, was not aware of anyone in his family with bleeding problems. Normal PT, prolonged PTT, serum corrected, age corrected, absorbed, did not crack. So you have to go through and kind of figure out what he has. I'll pause it while you guys do that. Okay, so let's keep going here. Okay. So we know that it has to be a factor that's only in the PCT pathway. So that'd be factor 12, 11, nine or eight. So it has to be one of those. Serum corrected, meaning it had to have it. Serum again has seven, nine, 10, 11, 12. <laughs> so you can rule out factor eight. Um, that would not have fixed it because factor eight is not in there. So factor eight is ruled out by the serum and also ruled out by the aged. Now we go down to adsorbed. Adsorbed did not correct it. So it has to be something that was missing and adsorbed is missing nine, so you can rule out 12 and 11 there. So it is factor nine deficiency, otherwise known as hemophilia B. Um, usually hemophilia B has a history of bleeding, so I know that was kind of deceiving on this case study, but yeah, when you do the mixing study, you come up with factor nine deficiency hemophilia B. And last case study, a 23 year old woman in her third trimester pregnancy is admitted to a hospital for evaluation of vaginal bleeding. When the bleeding worsens, a stat coag profile is ordered. So you see the results. What disease do we got? All right, it is definitely a DIC. So again, DIC does occur with something else going on. In this case, it's a complicated pregnancy or pregnancy issue. So yep, everything is auto whack there. And then one of the key tests that we didn't talk about earlier is that D-dimer. D-dimer will always tell us if there's possibly the presence of clots. And in the case of DIC, there's clots present. So that is definitely indicating DIC. Okay, the only thing I'm gonna say before we end is back to that stupid, I should have put there as history of bleeding with that hemophilia B, because that's what I've always taught you. There are acquired hemophilia, so they're not always inherited. There's acquired hemophilias. 
But yes, classically, they should have had a history. I should probably update that to people. I know that can be very confusing, but the results gave us a hemophilia B on that. Okay. That is it. So I'm going to stop the recording.